All right. Good morning, church. That was so good. Um, I just want to state, um, Javon, you are operating at just a whole different level of authority in your worship. Um, And this isn't a matter of skill, um, but the the mantle that is on you is has just increased so much um as soon as your voice comes through it just shifts the atmosphere and changes everything um so that's just exciting so thank you for for leading us in worship and being our worship leader yes can we thank him wow that was so amazing Let's just go home. I don't, what, are, what am I going to do? Oh, gosh. Oh. Is it just me? Like, is no one else a wreck right now? I'm a mess right now. Oh. Man. There are those moments. Um, those are moments where you're where you're walking with God, and and there's these times of worship and times of connection where it just feels so close. Um, and to come out of that feels so painful to have to to, to step back from that. Um, I'm reminded of the, there's a, a pastor that I heard once that was talking about Enoch. And uh, in, in scripture, like there's, a, it's just this really interesting tor- story in scripture. So this isn't my message. I'm just sharing because my heart's too full right now. Um, where Enoch, we, we're just told that God takes him to be with him. And the way it was explained to me, and I love this image because I, I, I think it's right. And I've, I've felt these moments before. Um, Enoch was just so close with God in this moment where God was like, you know what? We're closer to my place than yours now. Let's just go to my place. I like that. I feel like we were so close to that this morning. Like, oh, we're just almost closer to God's place than ours. And, um, and I don't want to go back to my place. His place is so much better. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. It's a big, big, big table. That's right. Come on, somebody. Um, oh, gosh. Okay. Lord, would you give me the grace I need to say your words today? Lord, help me. Would you come and meet us this morning? Would you bring a good seed and cause it to bear great fruit. As we prepare our hearts right now, Lord, I, I just choose to prepare my heart for the word that you have today, for the seed that you have for me today, for all of us today. Lord, come. Amen. Um, I'm going to ask, this is a, a weird thing, but I, I just really feel the need to. Uh, for those of you who are intercessors here this morning, can you be praying? Because I feel like we need, a, um, we need some protection over the room because I think there's going to be some stuff this morning and I, I just feel like that needs to be happening. So if you know that, and, and you'll know, like you know if you're supposed to be praying, but can you be praying just for protection over the house right now? So um, we're going through the book of Luke. This year, we're focusing on hope. Um, Oh, my gosh. Mm, Okay, so Luke 5. Open up to Luke 5. I just got to get started. You guys there? Luke 5? I'm going to start in verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 5. That comes right after chapter 4. Right before chapter 6. Just trying to help you out. All right. So here we go. Uh, today's message is entitled Hope for Sinners. Um, and, and 
an appropriate message, I think, as we are leaning into Holy Week and into next weekend being Easter weekend, uh, which make sure you know there's so much amazing stuff coming up. Uh, we have Good Friday breakfast. If you haven't gotten tickets for that, make sure talk to Pastor Brian over there. He can help you find the tickets for that. Uh, we have the Seder Friday night here, which is just such an incredible time of worship together. So join us for that. If you haven't been to a Seder yet, please, please, please come. Um, if you can't afford it, come and talk to me. We'll work something out. Uh, I'll have you uh, mow my lawn or something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you don't have to mow my lawn. Um, and then uh, we have the sunrise service. And we have our Easter service. We're going to be doing a baptism on Easter. Yeah. So much coming up. But prior to getting there, we, we, we have this. So in Luke 5, let's, uh, let's jump in. This entire chapter, we're seeing Jesus interacting with sinners, which actually is every chapter in Scripture because everyone he interacts with is sinners. But I think that's what Luke is highlighting here. Um, so let's dive in. Verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Okay, let me just pause for a moment. Uh, so Jesus gets into Simon's boat. Uh, you know, this is Peter, uh, if you haven't put that together yet. Um, so he gets into his boat and he asks him to put out. And Jesus knows Simon at this point. I, I think sometimes we forget that. Um, Jesus uh, excuse me, Simon Peter was introduced to Jesus already by Andrew. Uh, we learn about that in the book of John. Uh, Andrew, Peter's brother, was one of John's disciples, and then he was introduced to Jesus, and then he went and he found his brother Simon, and he brought Simon to Jesus so that they could meet Jesus. So they're already acquainted. They know about Jesus. They've met him before, and now they find themselves back at the Sea of Galilee, and they're fishing. They've gone back to their business. They've gone back to their work. Um, at some point, we don't know exactly when it happened, but they've returned to fishing. And I just want to point this out because this is really important to understand. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. There's a difference between liking Jesus and following him. They, they knew about him. They liked him. Uh, Andrew even said, I think we found the Messiah. Like, he was excited. There's, there's something there. But then they left. They, they didn't follow him at that time. Instead, they went back to the Sea of Galilee and, and went back to work, went back to their business. Um, yes, there's a difference. And I just want to make sure you understand that because I think sometimes we can miss that with the way we've expressed the message in the church. Uh, it, it's not just about liking Jesus. It's, it's not even just about loving Jesus. It's about following Jesus. And, and, and Jesus wasn't mad at them. He went and picked Simon's boat. He wasn't like, oh, you had your chance. Let me get in this other boat over here. He, he chose Simon. He's like, hey, Simon, remember me? Hey, okay, can I get in your boat? I'm, I'm going to teach some stuff. So I was like, yeah. Verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. I hate that translation. I will make you fishers of men. Can we just do that? Fish for people just sounds weird. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Okay, I just want to highlight, there's so much to share in here. I mean, you could talk about the importance of who you hang out with. Um, you know, 
Simon's partners were incredibly blessed just from being close to Simon, and their boats were filled too. And there, there's so many different messages we could talk about. What I want to highlight is Simon Peter's proclamation. Go away from me. I am a sinful man. You guys, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you recognize how completely unworthy you are to be in his presence. There's just something real about that. When you really get close to him, not know about him, but you begin to know him, you begin to have experience and life experience and encounter with him, all of a sudden you begin to question whether you can do this. Um, I remember when Corey and I were engaged, um, if you don't know, her family lineage is like these generals and giants in the faith. People that influenced and, and transformed Christianity definitely in Southern California had massive impact. I mean, there would be no Vineyard Church if it wasn't for her grandfather. Um, so much of what happened in Calvary Chapel is because of her family. And the, like the lineage is insane. And I remembered we were engaged at one point and the closer I got to her, the more I knew about her and more I knew about her family, I was like, I don't know if we could go through with this because I could never be the man of God that your father and your grandfather are. Like, I, 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 there's no way I could ever match up to that. Those shoes are far too big. I can never fill those and I feel like I'll just always be a disappointment. This is how it feels when you really encounter God. When you really connect with him and you have an encounter, with, there's moments where you're like, oh, this is cool. Eternal life, fantastic. Abundant life, even better. No point, oh, let's go. And then you really start to encounter him and you're like, oh wait, I don't know if I can do this. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. You, you, here's the thing. I think Simon is really struggling with the fact that they had the opportunity to follow Jesus already and they left and they went back to fishing. Which, by the way, when you read John 21 after this understanding, it just wrecks you. When, when Jesus comes after, after the resurrection, Jesus comes and he finds Peter fishing again. It tells us Peter jumps into the water as soon as he sees him and the boat's following behind him because he's just everything he can to get to Jesus as fast as possible. I think Peter in this moment is, is dealing with shame for the fact that why haven't we been following him all along? Why did we come back and start fishing again? I think that shame and that sin is coming up in him. He's, he just sees himself as a sinner. And here's what you need to know is that the enemy will always use your sin to convince you that you need to separate yourself from God. Whereas God will always use your sin to make you realize how much you need to draw near to him. Sin isn't something that should separate you from God. And, and I think this is something we've, in expressing and trying to teach truth in the church, I think we've done it a disservice. Yes, God is holy. He can't be with sin, but he made a way so that we can be with him. So the story now isn't that, oh, you're sinner uh, and you're sinful. You can't be with God. The story is like, yeah, that doesn't matter anymore because he paid the price and your sin should wake you up to the fact that you need to be so much closer to him. Just get close to him. Our sins should make us run to our Father, not run away from him. But the temptation inside of us, everything inside of us, when we have that encounter and we see how amazing he is, it's going to make us want to run away from him. And you need to know that is going to be a temptation that you have. I think in every season of faith, when you grow from glory to glory to glory and from grace to grace to grace, when you go to these deeper levels with God, these more intimate levels with God, there's always a temptation to back away in each one of those levels, in each one of those seasons. And someone said to me, every season has a new demon. It's true. And like every time you, you take an advance in your relationship with God, there's going to be a stronger power that comes against you and tries to push you away from him. Don't fall for that trap. Your sin should wake you up to the fact that you need him more and more and more. 
and it tells us that he left everything and followed him. To be clear, that includes the incredible miracle that Jesus just did and having them catch all these fish. And they left the boat and they left the nets and they left everything and followed him. We have to have a passion to chase the blesser and not the blessing. Let me keep going. Verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news spread about him, about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to him to be healed of their sicknesses. Okay, pause. I told you Jesus is interacting with sinners. This is, we're, in this whole chapter, we're just seeing it in different ways, in different situations. Leprosy is a disease of the flesh. That's When scripture uses the word leprosy, it doesn't refer specifically to what we refer to as leprosy with modern uh, medical terminology. Leprosy was any kind of disease of the flesh. So here's a man who is covered with flesh disease, who's covered with struggles of the flesh. And who of us isn't covered at some time with struggles of the flesh? And not only that, in that culture, in this time that they're writing this, someone who had leprosy was considered to be filled with sin. If you were covered in leprosy, that means you're filled with sin. Because otherwise you wouldn't have leprosy. This is a judgment on you because of all the sin that's in your life. The man is covered with leprosy. And the way he approaches Jesus, we have so much to learn from. This is how you approach Jesus as a savior. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Please notice, he's not asking him to heal him. He didn't say, Lord, if you're willing, you could heal my leprosy. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He understands the problem isn't the sickness. The problem is the sin. The problem, his problem that he needs is the the sin that's inside of him, the brokenness that's inside of him, the hurt that's inside of him, what it is to be an outcast from everyone, to have everybody judging you all the time, to, to be this one that doesn't belong, has no place where they belong, that wants to worship God but isn't welcomed in the temple, can find no hope and knows his brokenness. And he says, Lord, you can make me clean. Do you believe that Jesus can make you clean? Not just heal you of sicknesses, not just work incredible miracles. Do you believe that Jesus, bless you, can make you clean? It's a good time to get a blessing right there. I'm just saying. <laughs> Do you believe that? Like, seriously, this is not a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer out loud. But do you believe that's not something that you have to do? Do you believe that he can make you clean? The healing that you and I need more than anything else is a healing of the soul. We need our hearts and our souls and our spirit to be healed of the sickness of sin that's inside. But do we really believe that Jesus can make us clean? Because if we do believe that Jesus makes us clean, why do we hold on to the shame of our sin? Why do we keep coming back to that? Did he clean you or not? Why do we keep identifying ourselves as just sinners saved by grace? Did he clean you or not? We were sinners, 
and we were saved by grace. the, the, The scripture, when I read it, every time that Christians are referred to. They're not referred to as, Christ- or as sinners. They're referred to as saints. Why do we keep holding on to this identity that I'm just a sinner? Do you believe that he can make you well? Do you believe that he can heal you of that sin? Then why do we keep going back to it? He came to set you free, not just to forgive you. It's not like you're going to keep... His intention was never that you, like, okay, I'll forgive you the sin, and now you just have to carry around that sin with you everywhere you go. And he's like, well, I'm just going to have to keep forgiving you because you're a sinner. You're just going to keep sinning, so I'll just have to keep forgiving. No, he wants to set you free. And those who Christ sets free are free indeed. That's, 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 that's the focus. Do we believe that, though? <sighs> you guys have so much passion in me today. Blame Javon because worship was just too good. Um, verse 16. And now we get to, the, oh, this is so important. Verse 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I just need to pause here for a moment. He had this one guy who comes to him and asks him to make him clean. But then all of a sudden word spread and a bunch of people come to him wanting healing for sickness. I think that wore him out. If people came to him like, oh, I heard you can make us clean. I heard you can heal my soul and restore me. And, and, and instead, people are coming like, oh, I have leprosy too. Can you take care of the leprosy? And can you heal my leg? And can you heal this hurt? And can you heal this sickness? And Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed because he understood how important it was to be reconnected with the Father or to stay connected with the Father. Do you understand the context of this? The reason this is here, I I believe, is because the reason that he forgives our sin, the reason that he makes us clean, is so that we can be reconnected to the Father too. That's why. That's what this is all about. It's not so you could go to heaven when you die. It's so that you can be connected, reconnected with your Father in heaven. But that can't happen while you're still covered in sin. So he comes to heal us. Let him make you clean. Let him make you clean so that you can cling to your Father in heaven. Be restored to perfect love, which covers a multitude of sins. Let him do it. Let's keep going. Verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now, I'm I'm not going to teach on that verse, but that's just a really interesting verse. Because I think some of us have this mindset, um, especially people who tend to attack charismatic churches, like, well, if you could heal, why don't you just go into a hospital and clear everyone out? Like, it, it, even Jesus had a moment here where it says the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick, which seems to imply that it wasn't always there. There are times when he had the power where, where God was doing that. He could only do what he sees the Father doing. He can only operate by what the Spirit is empowering him to do in the moment. So that, that's just how it works. I just, just a side note. I said I wasn't going to teach on it. I'd tell you in a little bit. <laughs> let, let me just keep going, though. I think that's important to see, and I think it's easy to miss that. Verse 18, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Um, okay, we don't have a ton of time. All I'm going to say about this is, is the fun. There's so much to say. Notice when he saw the, the friends who were lowering him, When he saw their faith, he said to their friend, 
your sins are healed. That just blows my mind. That's a massive thing going on right there. I don't have time to really develop that, but here's what I want to point out. Is notice, Jesus again focused on the healing of the man's soul. They're legit lowering this guy on a mat because he can't walk, and Jesus' first thought isn't, man, we need to heal your body. His first thought was, oh, we need to heal your soul. Your sins are forgiven. You guys, what we need more than anything, anything, is to have our connection with the Father restored. It it wasn't about the sin and the brokenness. Jesus is like, oh, you need to be connected to Daddy. Your sins are forgiven. That's what you need right now. You have amazing friends. Look at these friends you have. You also have an amazing father. Let me make it so that you can access him right now. Your sins are forgiven. Verse 21, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's a good question. Uh, Verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or say, get up and walk but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Okay, just oh, so much to say. You can't see a forgiven sin. You can't see that. This is what faith is all about. You don't need faith to believe that God exists. You don't need faith to believe in God. You need faith to believe God. I think there's plenty of incredibly uh, powerful arguments, rational arguments that God does exist. I think it's hard to deny it. What you need incredible faith for is to actually believe him. That when he says your sins are forgiven, that you can actually hold on to that. Because you have to hold on to the hope of that promise. And hope is an incredibly powerful thing, an incredibly important thing. And I think what's happening here is Jesus is trying to help them learn how to hold on to hope. Look at what has been done so that you can hold on to the hope of what is promised. You can't see that he'll come through for you next time, but you can look at how he has never failed you up until now. You can't see that you'll live forever, but you can see that he defeated death. You can't see that your sins are forgiven but you can see that they no longer have the power over you that they used to. You can't see that he loves you, but you can see the cross. You can't see the future, but you can see remarkable things today. We allow the things that we do see to give us the strength to hold on to the hope for the things that we can't see. That's what's happening here. That's why Jesus heals this man. And by the way, notice what happens as soon as the man is first, he forgives his sins. And if I'm right, why is that so important? So he could be reconnected with his father. As soon as he gets up from the mat, what does he do? He starts praising his father. Verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, this is Matthew, for those who aren't aware, sitting at his tax booth. Now again, before I even continue, the tax collectors, they were despised people. These were people who betrayed their own people and were collecting taxes and and taking 
I, you know, the best way to picture it is Robin Hood. Like they're, they're taxing the poor and over the taxing the poor and, and going incredibly insane and taking as much as they can. And the tax collectors would take more than the people were required to pay so that they had some extra money. And the tax collectors ended up being very wealthy because they kept taking advantage of their people. These were horrible people. These were sinners taking advantage of their brothers and sisters who are already in pain and taking advantage of a horrible situation and making it worse for their own personal and selfish gain. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. You guys, Jesus doesn't sit there and try to talk to Levi about his sins. He doesn't have a big conversation like, how could you do this? Don't you feel horrible about your sins? Let me call the worship team up here and have them play a sad song so that you could feel horrible about your sins. And then you could come up and you could say this prayer. He doesn't talk to him about his sins. He doesn't ask him to sell everything he has or to leave everything he has. He just invites him to follow. Guys, that's what we need more than anything. It's what we need to do. Sometimes we feel like we, we have to fix everything. I gotta, I gotta take care of all of my sins and I gotta, I gotta, I gotta manage them all and I have, to, I, I have to make sure that I get everything right. Just get up and follow him. Just get up and follow, that's it. Let me keep going, verse 29, and I love this response. Then Levi had uh, held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. This is like a sinner's party. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Look at Jesus' strategy for dealing with sinners. He gets a soapbox and a loud megaphone and he stands on it and he screams at them, you're horrible sinners and you're going to go to hell. Repent now or burn. It's such an effective strategy. <laughs> what does Jesus do? with this massive group of horrible sinners. They're horrible sinners. Don't downplay it. These are the worst of the time. He throws a party. And he eats and he drinks with them. Because religious people are never okay with how Jesus relates to sinners. They're never okay with how okay Jesus is around sinners. He's fine. He's all right. Um, the, the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us aren't okay with sinners. We want people to be perfect and we want them to be holy. Especially like, we might be okay with them that they're sinners when they first come to church, but it's like, okay, you've been here for two weeks. I can't, why are you still doing that? Like, you have to be perfect now. And then like, man, for, if, if you get into leadership, you better not ever mess up. You better start hiding all that stuff because we're so uncomfortable with sin. We're so uncomfortable with sinners. We've somehow become the older brother in the prodigal son story. And we refuse to go to the party. But Jesus went to the party, and he ate with them, and he drank with them. I, I need to, sh this is just a very personal plea with you. And this is not a thus saith the Lord at all. I, I fully confess this is just 100% something that I'm struggling with. And as your pastor, I want to share this with you. Can we please, as a church, can we please stop developing and building a critical spirit. 
If you're always looking for what's wrong with someone, you'll never be able to see what's right. If you're constantly pointing out their mistakes and their flaws, you will never, ever be able to see the gold. Yes, we're the light of the world. Jesus has given us this mantle now. The purpose of the light isn't to point at all the darkness. Like, oh, look at all that darkness. Wow, look at it, it's all around us. Why do you turn a flashlight in in the dark, flashlight on in the dark? So you could see what the dark is hiding. So you could see the treasure, so that you could see the stairs, so that you could see the good thing that you need. Instead, we spend so much time and so much effort and so much political agenda and so much everything just trying to point out all of the dark. And the worst part is we do that from church to church to church, from denomination to denomination. I'm just, please, can we stop building a critical spirit? Don't tell me what you didn't like. Tell me what you did like about a message that you heard. Stop, please, can we stop training ourselves to just see the worst in this world? It's not hard to see the worst in this world, guys. It's blatant, it's obvious, but somehow we have become like, like, like sommeliers, like wine sommeliers at pointing out the darkness in this world. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm picking up, oh, what is that? Oh, is that self-righteousness? Yeah, I think that's self-righteousness I'm picking up. Here. Man, can, can we become, can we get our, our senses heightened to find the, the, the gold in people? And just be like, oh, oh, this person has the ability to shift atmospheres. I can see that. Oh, is that prophetic ability I'm sensing there? Wow. Sorry, I'm a terrible pastor talking about wine sommeliers. <laughs> Verse 33. Sorry, that was all just my passion, so you can toss that if you want to, but I I just ask, please. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Ironically, someone will be critical about me talking about not being critical, and it's just, you'll go out for lunch and have roast pasta. Verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking? (sighs) Don't miss it. They're they're questioning about like disciplines and making sure you're doing all the disciplines and doing all the things and adding more rigor to your... And in in verse 34, Jesus answered, can you make the friends of a bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch on an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Instead, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new for they say the old is better. First of all, Thank you, Jesus. I actually forgot this part was coming up next. I'm glad he talks about wine too. I don't feel so bad. But um, Jesus is telling them, you guys, everything's changed. The Jewish people were used to new rabbis coming out with their yoke. The rabbi's yoke is their interpretation of scripture, their way of understanding it. And so you have this 
uh, this Talmudic um, process and, and, and the Mishnah developed in, in trying to add on, like, here's another thing you have to do to be holy. And here's another thing you have to do to be holy. Here's another thing you have to do to be holy. And here's another thing. And so they just kept piling thing after thing after thing after thing. There's one day in scripture where you're commanded to fast for the Jewish people. And somehow that translated into the Pharisees fasting at least two days a week because they kept adding requirement onto requirement onto requirement onto requirement. This is the old wineskin. And Jesus is saying, listen, (laughs) that old wineskin is not going to hold what I have here. Jesus didn't come to bring new disciplines to add on to the old ones like all the other rabbis would have done at that time. He didn't come to put another yoke on people in addition to the yokes they were already carrying. He came to tell them, you have to take off that old yoke. Because that's a heavy yoke. You, you know the, the, vision, the visual of a yoke, right? They, they would put this, the, the wooden thing that they would put on the oxen, and the oxen would pull, and the yoke would hold onto their shoulders, and it would pull the plow behind them, right? And so the, the yoke that they're carrying is a heavy yoke. It's very burdensome. It's very difficult for them to pull. And he says, I have a light yoke. And what they're kind of asking him is, Um, why aren't you just putting your light yoke on them? But if you already have a heavy yoke, it doesn't matter how light the one you put on in addition to it is, it's heavier than what you had before. You're even more burdened, and that's not what he came for. He's like, okay, we have to take off that old one, and now I have this new one for you, and it's just a light yoke, an easy burden. Jesus brings new wine, and the new wine needs a new wineskin. The, the problem with wineskins, with old wineskins, is they've already been stretched, which means they are no longer flexible at all. They are static. They are stuck. They are rigorous. They, they're like, you, you cannot move it. And if you try to expand it, it'll just explode. The new wine requires a wineskin that is flexible, that can stretch. The old wineskin is a list of do's and don'ts and regulations. You can't follow Jesus. You can't carry the new wine with a list of do's and don'ts and commandments. That's not how it works. You're going to have to be a whole lot more flexible than that. What you have to do, instead of doing a bunch of do's and don'ts and making sure you fulfill the the letter of the law, is you have to follow him. That's the flexibility you have to have. Now, you guys have grown up with, like, Google Maps and stuff like that, but you don't understand what a big deal it used to be to give directions to people. (laughs) It was a big deal. No, even before MapQuest, that's even cheating. Like you would have like, okay, you have to go, you have to go three roads to the big boulder on the side, and then you're going to have to turn left. You go under a viaduct. As soon as you go under it, you'll see a scarecrow on the left. I grew up uh, part of my life in very farmland, so <laughs> this happened a lot. You had stuff like this. And you, like, you would get directions like that. And it's really confusing. You know what's so much easier? If you ask someone, oh, how do we get to their house? Oh, I'm going, just follow me. That's easy. But you gotta be flexible because you have no idea where you're gonna go. So if you had all the directions, you knew what was coming, you know, okay, in, in three streets I'm gonna turn left, I'm gonna be looking for a boulder, and like you, you, you knew exactly what you had to do. When you're following, you have to be very flexible. Because they may actually stop and get gas, and you have to stop and get gas with them. 
they may decide they want a Happy Meal. So you're going to McDonald's. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> he doesn't give us directions. That's the old wineskin. He just says, follow. Wherever he goes. So, Jesus' call to the sinners. First, your sin is meant to show you how much you need him and that you can't do this on your own. Jesus didn't come to punish you for your sins, but to make you clean. He wants to heal you from your sins. Third, he does this not because, not just because he hates sin so much, he does this so that you can be connected to the Father. That's what really matters. Fourth, so we are to follow him. Now, if your focus is on following him, you don't have time to take care of all of your sins. I'm, what I'm about to say is, is it can definitely be interpreted the wrong way, so try to hear my heart in this. Don't worry about your sins. He will worry about your sins. In fact, he's already taken care of it, and he will clean you and cleanse your soul. You just focus on following him, and it will take care of itself. The whole leaving it all behind to follow him means leaving behind the sin not going and dealing with every single one of the sins and trying to make it right and trying to fix it and try to just follow him. And the sins will fall off. The more you follow him, the closer you are to him, the, the deeper you go in your relationship. Because the deeper you go in your relationship, remember every new stage, you're going to have that moment where you're like, oh, I don't, I don't belong here. I don't deserve this. And you're going to be tempted to back away from him because all of a sudden those sins are going to come up. And then just again and anew, let that sin remind you of how much you need him and you need to be even closer to him. And those sins will continue to fall off. And finally, the old ways, the old wineskin, created a people obsessed with sin and judging one another. An inflexible system. A rigorous religious duty that you had to fulfill. But the new wine is filled with abundant life. And it requires a new wineskin to contain it. You've got to be flexible. And you've got to follow him closely. I'm going to close with this verse from Matthew 11. And I just want you to hear this for what it is. It's Jesus' plea to you. He's speaking to people who have been so worn down and beat down by a religious system, by an inflexible wineskin, by a list of do's and don'ts and having to get everything right and having to manage your sin and having to get everything perfect. He's talking to people who are just worn out because it's never good enough and it's just never enough. And these are his words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the courage to draw near to come to you. So many of us have tried so many times 
to get it all right and to make it all perfect and to do the do's and the don'ts and to, to manage the sin and to do all the, Lord, I just ask right now that you would silence the voice of the enemy that tells us that our sins pull us away from you. And Lord, would you speak through your spirit in our hearts right now that our sins are the sign that we need to come closer. Lord, I believe that you can make me clean. I believe that you can cleanse me. So I come to you now and I choose to follow you wherever you go. I pray this all to you, Abba Father, in the power of your Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, guys.